Hey, my name is Ben. Thanks for stopping by. So today we're taking a look at an electrical panel that was recently uh, wired, inspected, and passed. So we're just going to kind of go through the different aspects of it uh, just to kind of give you a good idea of another example of a panel that has been wired. Today's sponsor is House Call Pro. Head on over to housecallpro.com slash Ben to check out a free demo of the app. And if you use my link in the description, you'll get your first month for only $19. Starting with our service entrance cables here, they come down in the center conduit. We can see that those are copper wires. Uh, number one, just because they're a little bit smaller diameter, uh, but we'll take a look at them here in a minute. And right at, on the end of the main uh, breaker right here, we can see that this is 150 amp service. Now, uh, one kind of cool thing about this is that it has these electrical insulators on these top two poles here, and those are your each one of your hot legs coming in. So 120 volts there, 120 volts there. <clears throat> so those insulators are cool because if we de-energize this and then we turn this off, it would disconnect power to the two bars going down that all the breakers are powered from. And then these top two spots would be the places that are still energized. So I'll go ahead and pull one of these covers off here so you can see how it works. Uh, this is live, so I'm being careful to just pull this off carefully. So it just kind of slides over the cable as you can see. And right there is the lug uh, that is clamping onto our main uh, copper wire that is feeding this panel, this 150 amp panel. And we can see that that indeed is a copper wire. So that's the two hot wires there. Now the center one with the white tape on it is uh, the neutral wire. So that will be going back uh, to where it hooks from the electrical service. and. Uh, you can see we also have our copper wire here, and that is our grounding uh, conductor. And that's going to be going outside and connecting to two grounding rods that are at least 10 feet apart, I believe is what code says. Uh, and that's also going to be bonding to the water service. You can see right here where that copper wire coming from the panel is being bonded to this 6 gauge uh, copper insulated wire that comes down here to the uh, water supply that is coming into the building. This water supply is copper, which is why it has to be bonded, or it's metallic, so it has to be bonded to the electrical grounding system. If this was a plastic pipe coming in, then it would not be required to be bonded. And right here is typically where you would see a jumper going across from the copper over here, over the meter, to the copper um, right here, but in this case it's not copper anymore, it is PEX throughout the rest of the system, so it is not required to be bonded to the system because it can't be. Now these uh, electrical service wires coming in here are coming straight from the electrical meter, and one way we can tell that is that the bonding screw is still installed. So you see this green screw right there, that is bonding this neutral bus, or grounding bus, but we'll call it the neutral bus, it could be either, it's a combination. Sorry, but anyway, those two are bonded together. So the frame of this panel is bonded to that grounding bar slash neutral bus. If this were a sub panel, uh, it would be a little bit different in that we would have our bonding screw removed and a, this grounding wire here would be connecting into separate ground bars. So. But this is a typical main panel setup, but just wanted to kind of explain that technicality with the bonding screw. And where the main service entrance cables were brought through into the panel, they use a protective bushing here to prevent damage to the sheathing of the cables, and that is always advisable. So that's good there. When they were wiring this, they pulled all of their uh, wires back here, and then they chose to bring them down in conduit to protect them. Now, a lot of times you'll see those wires are just stapled to a wood surface coming down, but in this case it is conduit. So I don't know if that's uh, specific to this location, but that's how they did it. So uh, you have pairs of wires coming down in most of these conduits, except for the larger gauge wires. You can see that orange wire up there, which I believe is a dryer wire. Uh, that is connecting right down in here. and there is only one cable going through that, whereas the rest of these have two. You can also see that the sheathing, uh, the outer layer of protection, comes into the box just a little bit before it is stripped back. Now on the other side here, they actually used a piece of two inch PVC 
uh, conduit to bring down a bunch of the wires all in one. So they didn't have to use a bunch of small knockouts, they could just use one uh, main conduit and then the same thing. Those sheathing pieces are just trimmed once they come into the panel. I believe they have to have at least uh, around a half inch of sheathing inside the panel uh, visible. And I will mention that this panel is uh, near Omaha, Nebraska and passed inspection in late 2018. So things should be current up till that point in time. Okay, so the grounding here, you can kind of see how he did the grounding first. So a lot of the grounding wires he brought over to this side and all tie in on this side of the ground bar. Uh, and you can also note that each grounding screw or um, only has one ground wire attached to it, and that is your best bet. Always pay attention to uh, whether or not your panel allows more than one grounding conductor. Uh, sometimes they do, but one per screw is always the best bet. So as he pulled his circuits in here, he wrote on each cable uh, the place that the circuit was for. So uh, those would have initially been hanging down here and then when he trimmed the sheathing back he saved that little section which was probably right on the end and slid it up onto the wires. It looks like he slid it up onto uh, in some of them. This one has oh, just the hot and the neutral. So we have the hot wire and the neutral wire that he slid this over in order to keep track of those circuits which was helpful in the future for knowing which wires go where. Then the wires were just routed to the breakers that they needed to go to. In a plug-on neutral panel, these neutral bars going down here are designed in such a way that the breaker can snap onto the neutral and connect through the back of the breaker um, directly to the neutral, thus avoiding the need for all these pigtails. So with the exception of these few regular breakers, uh, most of the circuits have both the hot wire, which is the black one, and the neutral, which is the white one, uh, going directly to each designated breaker. And that's because any of these dual function, which are these purple buttoned ones here, or the arc fault breakers, require both the neutral and the hot wire to come directly to the breaker instead of having the neutral wire go into the neutral bus. That's why each one of these has to have a pigtail. With a couple of these though, you can see that we have a couple of regular breakers right here. Um, these ones have the hot wire coming to the breaker and that's it. Then the neutral wire is landing somewhere on the neutral bus. It doesn't really matter where. So I will link in the description below uh, the different types of panels available. The plug on neutral really frees up a lot of gutter space and makes your install a little bit cleaner. Okay, let's talk about load balancing for a minute, and that is basically the concept of that you want to have an, a similar or as close to an equal amount of um, power being drawn from both of the legs of power coming in here. So we have 120 volts on each one of these, and you want to draw a similar amount. And I've had people ask me before, if all of your double pole breakers, so in this case we have three of them, if they're all on the same side, is that going to cause an imbalanced load? And the answer is no. And the reason for that is that um, these two bars coming down here, there's a bar there and a bar there, and they come down like this and they have fingers that point in and they alternate. So every other breaker going down here is drawing from either one leg or the other. So if you have a double pole breaker right here, it's not drawing from the same side. It needs one from each side. So even if you had all of your double pole breakers on the same side, it would still be drawing on every other leg. Uh, now, if you wanted to create a major problem <laughs> and you wanted to have an imbalanced load, what you'd do is you'd install every other breaker. So you'd have a breaker here, 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 and so on and so forth. And that would essentially end up that you're only drawing from one leg and that would create a major imbalanced load. So you pretty much just want to start filling your panel and do it in a logical way and it will balance itself through just averaging out all the loads um, based on random placement really. We'll start talking through uh, some of these different circuits just to kind of uh, see how this was done. Um, but one thing I want to talk about right away is the concept of a dual function breaker versus a regular arc fault breaker. So uh, these white buttons here are for arc fault circuits 
And uh, those are pretty much required in most areas of the home nowadays. Um, and so the only difference between that and a dual function is that this is both arc fault and ground fault. So you can see here the outside outlets, uh, the disposal, um, the garbage disposal, I believe, and the dishwasher are all on dual function breakers. And the slick thing about that is you don't have to have a ground fault outlet or a blank face ground fault uh, somewhere else in order to protect the disposal and the dishwasher. So a dual function breaker is an excellent option in this case. That is one of the positives of using a dual function. Now, especially with an outside outlet, uh, those ground fault outlets tend to fail a lot faster because they're just in a in poorer conditions overall. And I made a video about how to change from using a ground fault outlet and switching to a dual function breaker. So I'll link that in the description or put a card here uh, so you can kind of understand that concept a little bit better. Uh, so right here we have a ground fault outlet. So this one's obviously being done in the other way. So let's take a look. These wires, I'll just show you. It comes from this bottom one right here. Panel outlet. So uh, this is being powered by an arc fault breaker. And it's a 20 amp breaker it looks like. So it's arc fault here. But it's required that this area have a ground fault outlet. So you're having a ground fault outlet that is protecting this area in addition to the arc fault breaker. Now it could have just been a dual function breaker and then this could have been a regular outlet. So you can do that with the kitchen, you can do that with the bathrooms and uh, that can help you save a little bit of money actually because the difference in price between an arc fault breaker and a ground fault breaker is usually like five bucks. So um, you can avoid using those ground fault outlets altogether just by using dual function. That's what I did at my house for the most part. The only drawback is if you get a nuisance trip or uh, for some reason that ground fault breaker trips, you have to come all the way back down to your panel to reset it instead of just being able to press the reset button on the panel or on the outlet itself. This top breaker right here is powering an ejector pump or a sewage pump. And so that's a 20 amp breaker. That's a regular breaker. It does not need to be ground, or I mean arc fault. Uh, but right over here, you can see that that is being powered by a ground fault outlet here. And that, so it is protected via ground fault via a ground fault receptacle. Now a good idea for an ejector pump is to use an audible trip ground fault receptacle. So one that will have a sound when it trips. You, that's also a good idea for freezers and things like that. So this one right here is actually powering a freezer. And so it would be a good idea to have this be an audible one so that if it trips, it makes a sound. And I actually did that at my house as well uh, for my sump pump. So if it trips, it makes a beeping sound and I can go and reset it and it doesn't flood my basement. I'll link to one of those audible ground fault receptacles in the description below. The second one down here is a dedicated 15 amp breaker for the furnace and that is not required to be ground fault or arc fault as far as I am aware. So that is a standard breaker with nothing else on it which is pretty unusual now which is pretty interesting. The third one down here is a double pole breaker that is feeding an air conditioner. So that is a 20 amp double pole breaker. Now the uh, air conditioner needs two legs uh, of power with 120 volts each, obviously. And so therefore it can be simply a 12-2 wire, which is your regular yellow wire uh, powering that air conditioner outside. Uh, but you'll notice that both of these wires connecting here are black. And uh, you can do that with either black electrical tape, or in this case, that wire was actually colored with a Sharpie. Let me see if I can find the top of it here. You can see maybe where it turns white again. After following that up here, right there, you can see where the Sharpie ends. But that black designates that that's actually a hot wire. It is not a neutral. It needs to be marked on both ends that it is no longer a neutral wire. So since it's 20 amps, you can just use a regular 12-2 cable and uh, color the one to designate it. So we have a few regular general circuits here. Uh, bedroom, I believe that's kitchen lights, kitchen plugs. Uh, so those are all arc fault breakers and the kitchen ones are most likely protected by 
more ground fault outlets because they are required to be. Um, and then the wires coming back for each one of those circuits come back in pairs. So the neutral and the hot wire both hook into the breaker, as you can see right there, for each one of those circuits. And then the pigtail transfers that neutral back to the neutral bus. Right here is a double pole breaker again. This is powering a dryer circuit, I believe. So we have a 10 gauge wire that is coming out of that. I should mention also with these, you know, 15 amp is 14 gauge, 20 amp is 12 gauge, 30 amp is 10 gauge. Uh, so that's should be the sizes of those wires. One interesting thing to note about the dryer circuit, um, an electric water heater is also a 30 amp, 220 volt circuit, but it's only a 10-2 wire, and we don't have an electric water heater here at the moment, but an electric water heater, you just need two legs of power and a ground wire. Uh, much like the air conditioner, this is the same way, two legs of power and a ground wire, which is why you can use a 12-2 cable. Um, but in the case of a dryer or an electric range, you actually have to have three wires. So a 10-3, which means that we have a neutral in addition to our two hot wires and a ground. And the reason for that is that some electronic components inside of a dryer, an electric dryer, or an electric uh, range or oven, have 110 volt components. And those 110 volt components take power from one of the legs and need to put it back onto a neutral wire and not the ground. That's why the older plugs uh, for a dryer or an electric range uh, had three wires. They were just putting some power back onto the ground wire, which is now not allowed. And the new ones have a neutral, which is why there's four wires, two hot wires, a neutral, and a ground. Something to note. Hopefully that makes sense. And you can see right up here, indeed, that the this orange cable there uh, has two hot wires, a black and red, and a white wire, which is the neutral, and a ground. And here on this 40 amp range uh, breaker, we have the same thing. Two hot wires, and you can see the neutral right behind them there, as well as a ground. Not sure exactly where the ground wire is routed for that, but 40 amp breaker supplying the range. Then we have a water heater, um, and that is being powered by just a single pole uh, arc fault breaker. And I think the reason it's arc fault is that it is, um, it's a power vent gas water heater. And so it has just a regular receptacle that things are being powered from. So I think maybe that's why it had to be an arc fault. Um, someone comment down below if you know exactly why. Um, but I believe that's the case. And then we have another bathroom circuit. And then just more general circuits uh, throughout the house that are arc fault. And the bottom one here is a sump pump. And that one is also being protected by a different uh, ground fault receptacle. We already covered these dual function breakers so that they don't have to use ground fault receptacles. Uh, and then here, we'll just kind of keep working our way down. Living room up outlets, arc fault breaker, another arc fault breaker for downstairs power, another bathroom one, garage, microwave, 20 amp, arc fault. Basically arc fault on virtually everything. You can always assume, you can always put in an arc fault breaker if you're not sure and it's not going to cause you to fail inspection, but putting in a regular breaker when you were required to have an arc fault will cause you to fail, and it just adds some additional safety to your house anyway. Uh, kitchen outlets, pantry, another one, another one. So that's pretty much all of them. I think we kind of covered all the main aspects of the different circuits in this particular panel. Again, if this helped you out, please hit that thumbs up button down below and subscribe to the channel for more videos just like this one. And hit that bell icon to be notified about future videos. Links in the description to useful things related to wiring a panel, as well as my other primary video that I already made about how to wire a main panel and how I did it at my place. So definitely check that out as well.